So hypothesis testing is another form of inferential statistics. And it's a little bit different than confidence intervals, yet they're very related. Um, the results of the two types of things, of creating a confidence interval and doing a hypothesis test under the same um, under the same assumptions, will they will have the same results. Okay, so here is what a hypothesis step, a hypothesis test is. It's a statement regarding a characteristic of one or more populations. So we might say that the proportion of students who will return for fall semester is 60%. So we're making a claim there that in fall, we will have 60% of our students return for classes, right? So that's our hypothesis. We will then go about a formal process We'll select sample evidence by calling a bunch of you and saying, are you gonna return fall semester? And then we're gonna test based on our sample, does our sample predict or support the evidence? Does it have enough evidence to support our claim about the percentage of students returning to campus? So it essentially has three steps. We make this statement, we collect the evidence, which is the sample, and then we analyze the data to test the plausibility of the statement. So one of the key things that isn't actually true is we are going to assume that there's a known value for the population parameter and that it's a specific number. Like when I said 60% of students will return in fall, that's we're saying that that's the known value. That's often never true. And then we're going to test whether that makes sense with the sample statistics we have. Okay, so we skipped this part. Um, so recall from section 1.1, a parameter is a numerical measure of a population. A statistic is a numerical measure of a sample. So the four parameters we have studied in this course, we've actually only studied um, three, but the four that we have is the mean that goes with X bar, the uh, standard deviation, oops, that goes with S, the variance, which goes with S squared, and the proportion, which goes with a P hat. So these top numbers are parameters. Um, technology, right? So these top values are parameters. These bottom values are statistics. So um, like we mentioned back at the confidence intervals, we are only going to be doing these two. Know that we could mess with these other two. And we used to back in the day. OK. Oh, boy, you couldn't see that. So let's do it. Well, no, what we're doing now is just looking at the language. So if you look at your reference sheet, where is it? Let me pull up. So in 10-2 on um, Wednesday, this is what we're going to do. This is the entire test from start to finish. Step one through step six. And this might look really intimidating to you, right? This whole page, you're going to fill this, this whole thing out. But the reality is it's not too difficult if you figure out what each of these pieces are. And today we're gonna to talk about step one, step five and step six. And then on Wednesday, we're actually gonna do a test from start to finish. And as long as you practice it and do it, you will be totally fine. If you don't ever practice it, you're gonna look at these things and be like, what in the world is that? Okay, so step one, how do we make our hypothesis? Well, this is a key thing. There's a thing called the null hypothesis and a thing called the alternative hypothesis. So these are always the two hypotheses that you make. This is always listed as HO 
for meaning zero change. So it's a statement of no change, no effect, or no difference in the population parameter of interest. And then this statement is assumed to be true until we prove otherwise. Well, I shouldn't say prove, until we have evidence otherwise. And then the alternative hypothesis, we can write it in two different ways, H1 or HA. Yes, this, um, no, this will be on my YouTube channel, this, this uh, saved lecture. And I am recording, I have remembered to. So it's a statement that claims there is some sort of change and there's only three options. You could do more, you could do less, or you could do different. So here's a note about what this hypothesis test is like. It's similar to the, um, the justice system in that it's like a trial. And in America, you're assumed innocent until proven guilty. We're saying the same thing here. We assume there is no change, nothing has happened until we find evidence to support that there is change. So we assume the null hypothesis is true. And then if the data is strong enough against the null, null hypothesis, we reject it and believe that the alternative hypothesis may be true. And then we have these, um, these different parameters that we may use for hypotheses. We could have a mean, we could have a proportion, and then in order, we could have a variance or standard deviation. Recall that the variance is equal to the standard deviation squared or the square root of the variance is the standard deviation. Again, we're only gonna do these two. We're not gonna do that one. So uh, here's some examples. There are two types of tests. We could do one-tailed tests or two-tailed tests. There are two type of one-tailed tests. There's a right-tailed test. It's a right-tailed test if all our, turn, all, our alternative hypothesis claims that the parameter is larger than a particular value. It's a left-tailed test if we claim that our parameter is less than some number. Remember when we say parameter, it's either gonna be a mean or a proportion. And then a two-tailed test is when we say, oh, the parameter is just not equal to some number. So I'm gonna do an example of this on the next page. And then maybe we'll come back and put in some keywords. All right, I know this is crazy, but here we go. So um, what's gonna happen, by the way, what used to happen on exam three, the paper exam, is this was what the exam looked like, for one of the questions, 15 points answer this, and it's just a big old blank page. Look at your pre-do. There are two questions that are like that, a big old blank page with this paragraph that you fill in. So we're only focused on the very first step. I'm gonna write it step one. And our job is to identify the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. That's it, that's all we're asked to do here. So let's read the problem. Um, we've got active management labor, now called AML, is a group of interventions designed to help reduce, that's a key word, the length of labor and the rate of cesarean deliveries of babies. So we're talking about having a natural birth here. So according to a recent article, the average cost, this tells us right now, we're dealing with a mean. So I can immediately go to my hypotheses and I can state that the parameter we're of interest here is mu. So the average cost of having a baby in a US hospital is $2,528. Note that is a parameter. It didn't say sample anywhere. Look at the next sentence. A random sample of 200 AML deliveries. Note this is the size of the sample, so that's N had a mean cost, oh, there's that, that word mean. This time, that one is an X bar because it came from a sample. So at a mean cost of 2480 with a standard deviation, recall that since this is from a sample, that would be an S of 766. Okay, how's everyone feeling so far?
So here comes the question. Do the data provide sufficient evidence to conclude that on average, AML reduces the cost of having a baby in a US hospital? So note, we have some known parameter value, some believed parameter value that the average cost across America is 25, 28. This number for the alternative hypothesis has to be the same thing. These numbers are always exactly the same. And then what we have to decide is what kind of test are we gonna do based on this word? Are we claiming that the parameter is larger than this known value? is smaller than this uh, assumed value or is not equal to. And because of the word reduces, we would say this is a less than. And since it's a less than, the type of test we're gonna do here is a left tail test. Hi, Jenna. You're watching bubble guppies. You go watch it. I got it. I'm teaching class. Okay, so See if you all can't figure out question B. Oh, is that you again? <laughs> That's me. Okay, so it's not. But what about me? What about you? Can I ask you a question? Yeah, please. If it's saying proportion, would that be uh um would that be a, a statistic? Sorry, say it again. It's saying proportion. So would that say that it's being a statistic? I don't know. Well, good point. The The fact that it says proportion means you're going to be working with a P and there'll also be a P hat somewhere in the problem. Potentially. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So based on Theo's question, we know that H1 is going to have a P equal to something, or sorry, HO, and HA is going to be a P, and we still have to figure out what sign to go here. And then the other thing we have to figure out is what is the population proportion that's claimed somewhere in the problem? I see a percent here. I see that they conducted a poll of 1283 random people, so that's an N value. I see that they found 205 currently used drugs. Turns out that's an X value. That's the lesser known one. So our P hat is always X over N. So in this case, it's 205 over 1283. That means our P is 0.136. So this should be 0.136. That means this must also be 0.136. All we have to do is figure out what symbol goes here. What did the researcher claim? So I'll go back to that sentence. A psychology researcher at a university believes that the portion of these people who are current users of those drugs has changed. Does that mean less than, greater than, or not equal to? Equal to? Good. That means this is going to be a two-tailed test. Hey, you all are getting it, right? Got it. Wrong. Oh, you got, you got the proportion part. That's good. Well, what's the point 136? That's the 205 divided by 1283? No, the point 136 is what this... Oh, okay. This claim what we this article said this is the proportion of all 18 to 25 year olds that currently use marijuana oh okay thank you um let me grab my calculator that 205 divided by 1283 is a number higher 0.15978 something 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 so one of the things to note is the sample value we have for p is a number that's different. So we do have evidence that it's changed. We're just gonna have to test if that's statistically significant. And that's what's coming in 10-2. Oh my goodness. Oh, 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 Alyssa. You're showing us your screen. Did you know that? 
no. <laughs> oh, I stopped it. There we go. I thought the, I thought the screen was ending. And I was like, no. Uh oh, my bad. You're okay. Um, you all, it's going to happen. Um, in about 20 minutes, the the session's going to die again because of Zoom. Are you okay, gonna, let's do. Go ahead. Eric, are you thinking you're going to switch back to Big Blue Button? I don't know. Just let me know. I I maybe tomorrow I'll try Big Blue Button and see how it it shows up and everything goes with that just to try it sure and then i'll just let you know for wednesday because obviously it's not going to give us the free we would have to sign up with the thing because yeah. yeah every everybody else now i found out ha is having to, to pay the 15 dollars to do it but gotcha. well big blue button is working for me and my all my yeah. other classes yeah we might if we... go back to it yeah Plus, it, it just records right on there for you, so we don't have to upload any. Yes. That's nice. It is nicer on that end. Yeah. Okay, so let's do this next question, this last one. And then um, I know Cindy's doing the worksheets with you. That 10-1 worksheet has a lot of really good practice of this. This is an essential skill. In my estimation, if you can do this, you can do the entire rest of the problem. I think this is the most difficult part. Because once you've identified everything, it's just putting the pieces together in the puzzle. Okay, so a fast food restaurant chain states that the standard deviation of wait times for customers in a drive-thru is three minutes. Now notice, this it didn't say a sample. So this is saying that the population value is three for the standard deviation. So a consumer rights agency thinks the variability, that's a... Uh, uh, a description of what standard deviation measures and wait times is more than this. They obtain a random sample of 27 drive through people, so that's in, and find a standard deviation of 3.9. So our only job here is to do step one, which is to figure out what's the, this thing and this thing. Well, the parameter that was stated is this parameter, standard deviation. So we should have sigmas here. We know from the what it says that that standard deviation is equal to three. Based on these words, more than, we should have a greater than, and this number has to be exactly the same. This is a right tail test. Why do you know that it's a right tail test? Like, how do you figure Great. that out? question because if it's a greater than symbol it's a right tail test if it's a less than symbol it's a left tail test if it's not equal to it's a two tail test you guys notice that with all of these the h naught the first one it's always an equal sign that first one is always equals every single that, time that's on that paper If I could find where I put the, the big, oh, here it is. So here's, here's really where you're gonna look at this stuff. So this is the specific test, the hypothesis test for a population proportion. These are the three options for step one. Notice in all of them, you have P equal to some number, P equal to some number, P equal to some number, regardless of whether it's two-tailed, left-tailed, or right-tailed. And then not equal to goes to two-tailed, less than goes to left tail, greater than goes with right tail. That's how we know. Um, I have a question. Please. So on C, they, they give you two standard deviations. They give you the three minutes and then they give you the 3.9 minutes. How do you know which one to use? See these words right here? Yes. Random samples tells you that this is a sample value. Okay. And then this one, since it doesn't say random sample, my cat here is Aww. attacking my screen. Okay, get out of here. So, um, so because it doesn't say sample up here, we know this is the parameter value. And if you notice back here, we were given a P hat and a P. And up here, we were given two means as well. So every time you do one of these problems, you will get two values. 
one for a sample, one for the population. The population one is what goes in step one. That was a really good question, by the way. So the 3.9 is the sample, it's not the standard deviation? Correct. You're okay. gonna use that value. So this 3.9 you're gonna use when you get to step um, three, although it's not, this, this is the wrong test. Just like up here, we only wrote down the point um, 136. We're going to use this p hat when we run the rest of the test. And then up here, we didn't use the 2480. We're going to use that later when we run the rest of the test. Okay, can you just pull down your paper again? Oh, we only got 10 minutes left. Sorry. It's okay. No, no. And then I'll have to restart the session. Has nothing but you said that you're on from three to five or you people can schedule with you yes i'm just i'm just already on and you can schedule time with me definitely like you're on here at three o'clock um i'll be in a big blue button session so if you send me an email and say hey can we chat live and then i'll just um i'll just send you a link to this to the session okay thank you you're welcome Okay, other questions on this? Okay, so in 10 minutes, this thing's gonna shut down. So just get ready. I'll send you another email the same way it came, the last one with the new link. So now we're gonna skip steps three and four and we're gonna run jump right to step five in the hypothesis test. And that is, so we've got our, our null and an alternative hypothesis set up. We've run the test and we've got all the results. How do we make conclusions, which is the job of test step five? So step five is you make the decision. Step six is you write down what the decision is. There's only two options. Either you're gonna reject HO, or you're going to not reject HO. If you reject HO, you're going to write this sentence exactly. There is sufficient evidence to support the claim that, and then you're going to write in H1 and whatever the words were for it. And then if you decided to not reject HO back in step five, you're going to write, there is not sufficient evidence to support the claim that blah, 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 whatever it was. So only two options, step five and six are intimately connected. Once you know step five, you know step six. If you were writing a reference sheet, I would say put this in your reference sheet because you're going to write this a thousand times. Um, so only two, two options. Okay, so here we go. Before the, the time runs out, let's see if we can't do example two. So boxes of a certain kind of cereal are labeled as containing 16 ounces. An inspector thinks the mean weight, so we're talking about mu, may be less than so we're talking about a left tail test, less than this, so that company can scam its customers. He collects a random sample of cereal boxes and weighs them to test his idea. Notice we're claiming that the mean weight is 16 ounces. So when we're asked to state the null and alternative hypotheses, this is step one. Um, I'm using S1 instead of STEP, step one, right? So HO is that the mean is equal to 16. H1 is that the mean is, because of the word less than, less than 16, and this is a left tail test. Okay, so we've identified that. Let's then say that our inspector decides to reject the null hypothesis. So he does all his work and makes this decision. How would we write the conclusion? We would copy and paste this. So here goes. There is, I'm going to say enough instead of sufficient because it's easier to spell. And it's essentially the same word. There is enough evidence to support the claim that, and here's our claim. Notice it's right here. An inspector thinks that, notice the word that. That matches with this word that. You can copy and paste all the rest of this. That the uh, mean weight 
is less than, and we'll go back to what the claim was, 16 ounces. Bam, that's it. Question C says, well, what if he did not reject the null hypothesis? It's the same exact sentence, except to put the word not right here. So here goes. There is not sufficient evidence to support the claim. That the mean weight is less than, I mean, I suppose we should really put in here the mean weight of the cereal boxes, but eh, we'll be okay with that. How do y'all feel? Good. Okay. <laughs> it's It's not too crazy, right? It's just... We're gonna we're gonna learn how to do this, but this is what you write if you reject or do not reject. That's it. And it turns out this making this decision isn't that difficult either. Once you see the piece of how to do it. So if I was to summarize, because it's the meeting is about to end, and I'm gonna have to send you a link. We've learned two things. We've learned how to state the null and alternative hypotheses. And we've learned how to write step six, how to write the conclusion. If we decide to reject the null hypothesis, we say this. If we decide to not reject the, the null hypothesis, we say this. That's it. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start the next meeting. I'm going to put the link in here, and maybe you all can just join in. Let me see, can I do it? Can I do two meetings at once? I can't. Oh, shoot. Okay. Never mind. All right. So it turns out when we make when we do step five. So step five, where we make the decision. Remember, there's only two decisions. You can either, number one, reject HO. Then we'd say there is sufficient evidence, blah, 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 blah. Or number two, you could do not reject HO. Or you could say fail to reject HO. Is either one of these two options. five? Say it again. The S5, is that it? Yes. Okay, I just said no. That's all right. No, I should write step five. Yes. Yeah. So this is the fifth step. So it turns out when you do that, there's really four things that could happen. Because you could make a mistake when you make that rejection. So um, this is a handy little thing that I would encourage you to like tattoo to your forearm or something. Uh, no, don't do that. But this is a handy thing to have available to you um, easily. And that is so we're going to make one of these two decisions and in reality one of these two things are true so it could be that the null hypothesis in reality is true we go and gather our sample evidence and if we don't reject ho then we made the correct decision but if we gathered our sample evidence did our analysis and rejected ho when it's true we've made what's called a type one error so my math lab is going to say which type of error has happened, type one, type two, or was it the correct decision? This is how you know. Okay, so this is assuming the null hypothesis is true. Well, if in reality the null hypothesis is false and we fail to reject it, that's a type two error. If it was false and we did reject HO, then we're claiming the alternative hypothesis, there's evidence to support it, then we made the correct decision. So these are the four things that could happen. So we're going to look at this in terms of the criminal justice system. So we're going to state the null and alternative hypotheses. These are not um, always true, but this is at least what America tries to state is true. 
Um, in other countries, where they don't have as robust um, a criminal justice system. It's a different statement. So the alternative statement or the null hypothesis is you're innocent. And if we put in the, the thing here, you're innocent until proven guilty. Right. That's that's what the law is supposed to do when they see when they look at you. As a, uh, uh, you get pulled over by the cops and they issue a ticket and you go to court, the judge is supposed to look at you and, and see you as innocent until um, the officer presents all the evidence to prove that you are guilty. So the alternative hypothesis is it's on the burden, it's the burden of the state to show that you